This video was produced by Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, welcome to the last reading in the Furious Flower uh, Poetry Center reading series. It's really exciting to see such a, a great crowd. We have um, opened up these seats if folks are looking for a place and they don't mind sitting in the front. Um, if people are here for the passport event, you can get your stamps in the back. You can see Karen's waving, um, and there'll be someone at the table to, to give you your stamp. Um, so I'm really excited to um, introduce Ross Gay. In an essay uh, published in The Sun, Ross Gay describes his first foray into beekeeping. He writes, I took off my shirt and wore my thinnest soled shoes so as to be both as close to the earth as I could and as vulnerable to the bees as they were to me. I was trying to convey to them my good intentions. He admits that this might seem crazy, but he also knew it was right. This story reads to me like a parable of how Ross approaches the poem. Fully present, unprotected by the cynicism, wit, and irony that marks a certain strain of contemporary American poetry. And he approaches it with good intentions, to celebrate, to assert the sacredness of the body, or in his words, to try to be as unbrutal as I can, even while exploring brutality and asking how the violence around us shapes who we are. And it, and it often does seem a little crazy. <laughs> Sentences pushed to their fullest limit, the sheer insanity of calling a poetry collection the catalog of unabashed gratitude in this day and age. And yet, it's also right, the product of endless revision, studying of syntax, and the willingness to combine play and prayer. Ross has won a number of awards, and those are <coughs> written on the back of your bio sheet if you want to read about them. But I think he would rather me list some of the fruit that is being grown in the Bloomington Community Orchard, which is a free fruit for all orchard in Bloomington, Indiana, that Ross helped found as a, as a board member. OK, here's my memory. There are apples. There are lots of different kinds of apples. There are pears. There are Asian pears. There's a fig tree. There, is there more than one fig tree? Two. There are two fig no, trees. Um, mice ate more than Oh, <laughs> there were two. <laughs> um, there's service berries, uh, and there are jujube berries. Mm -hmm. Jujubes? Jujubes. Jujubes. And tart cherries. And tart cherries. Ground cherries. Yeah. Pawpaw. Pawpaws. Blackberry. <laughs> Blueberry. 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 And if I am correct, there's also a beehive. Yeah, two. Two beehives. Yeah. So welcome, Ross Gay. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, hi. Hello. It's good to see you all. Um, hey, I wonder if you all could come here so I could look at you a little bit. <laughs> not, like, not like in a scary way, just like a, I just want to be able to see you. No, let's move the chairs for you. Why don't we do that? Let's do it. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Good. It's good to see you. Um, thank you so much. It's so good to see Elizabeth and kind of you to say that nice introduction and everything. Um, and I'm going to read to you for like, I think probably like 35 to 40 minutes and see how it goes. All right? 
It's neat to see football players in the audience. That makes me happy. I played football in college, too. Um, <coughs> it's neat to see all the rest of you, too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to start with this poem called To the Fig Tree on Ninth and Christian Street. So um, who's eating a fresh fig off of a tree? Oh, oh, very few of you. There's so much joy left in your life. You're going to go find a fig tree and eat a fig off of it. Figs grow down here, you know. Um, so this is a real fig tree at Ninth and Christian, which is a, a street in, area in Philadelphia, South Philly. And I was just walking by one day going to get breakfast. And this tree, which I had known about, it was, it was making the fruit. And fig trees, when they're big and abundant, they drop their fruits like crazy. And it can be a little bit of a mess, but if you've eaten fresh figs, it's not a mess. It's like a blessing. It's a crazy blessing. So anyway, this is sort of to the fig tree on Ninth and Christian. <clears throat> Tumbling through the city in my mind without once looking up, the racket in the lug work probably rehearsing some stupid thing I said or did some crime or other. The city, they say, is a lonely place until, yes, the sound of sweeping and a woman, yes, with a broom, beneath which you are now too the canopy of a fig, its arms pulling the September sun to it. And she has a hose too and so works hard, rinsing and scrubbing the sidewalk, lest some poor sod slip on the silk of a fig and break his hip and not probably reach over to gobble up the perpetrator. The light catches the veins in her hands when I ask about the tree. They flutter in the air, and she says, take as much as you can. Help me. So I load my pockets and mouth, and she points to the stepladder against the wall to mean more. But I was without a sack, so my meager plunder would have to suffice. And an old woman whom gravity was pulling into the earth loosed one from a low-slung branch, and its eye wept like hers which she dabbed with a kerchief as she cleaved the fig with what remained of her teeth. And soon there were eight or nine people gathered beneath the tree, looking into it like a constellation, pointing. Do you see it? And I am tall and so good for these things. And a bald man even told me so when I grabbed three or four for him, reaching into the giddy throngs of yellow jackets, sugar stoned, which he only pointed to smiling and rubbing his stomach. I mean, he was really rubbing his stomach, like there was a baby in there. It was hot. His head shone while he offered recipes to the group using words which I couldn't understand. And besides, I was a little tipsy on the dance of the velvety heart rolling in my mouth, pulling me down and down into the oldest countries of my body where I ate my first fig from the hand of a man who escaped his country by swimming through the night and maybe never said more than five words to me at once, but gave me figs. And a man on his way to work hops twice to reach at last his fig, which he smiles at and calls baby. Come here, baby, he says, and blows a kiss to the tree, which everyone knows cannot grow this far north, being Mediterranean and favoring the rocky sun-baked soils of Jordan and Sicily. But no one told the fig tree or the immigrants there was a way the fig tree grows in groves. It wants, it seems, to hold us. Yes, I am anthropomorphizing, God damn it. I have twice in the last 30 seconds rubbed my sweaty forearm into someone else's sweaty shoulder, gleeful, eating out of each other's hands on Christian Street in Philadelphia, a city like most, which has murdered its own people. This is true. We are feeding each other from a tree at the corner of Christian and Ninth, strangers maybe never again. Thank you. I want to read this poem called uh, To My Best Friend's Big Sister. So I got to tell you a couple things before I get into this one or ask you questions. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to ask. Um, does anyone know who Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock are? Yeah? Who? 
They're singers. They're like an, anyone else now? Like a late 80s, early 90s hip hop group, right? There's a song called It Takes Two um, that they, you can look it up on YouTube later. Um, so that, that shows up in this poem. And then Isaac Hayes shows up in this poem. Huh? With a full beard. With a full beard, he does, yeah. Do people know who Isaac Hayes is? Who is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Important soul singer. Um, if you don't know Isaac, okay. Look him up if you don't know him. And he was on South Park, too. That's amazing. Who was he chef on South Park? Yeah, amazing. I think that's all you need to know. Oh, you need to know one more thing. Do you all know what a Walkman is? <laughs> Do you know what a Walkman is? A Sony Walkman? Okay, okay. Just check him. That's how we used to listen to music back in the 1800s. <laughs> to my best friend's big sister. One never knows, does one, how one comes to be standing most ways to naked in front of one's pal's big sister, who has simply, by telling me to, gotten me to shed all but the scantest flap of fabric and twirl before her like a rotisserie chicken as she observes and offers thoughtful critique of my just pubescent physique, which is not a thing to behold. What with my damp trunks clinging to my damp crotch, and proportion and grace are words the definition of which I don't yet know, nor did I ask the many-skirted scientist sitting open-legged and now shoeless on my mom's couch. Though it may have been just this morning while chucking papers, I heard through the Rob bass and DJ Easy Rock pulsing my Walkman, a morning dove struggling, snared in the downspout's mouth. And without lowering the volume or missing a verse, I crinkled the rusted aluminum trap enough that with a little wriggle it was free and did not at once wobble to some power line, but sat on my hand and looked at me for at least one verse of It Takes Two sort of bombing its head and cooing once or twice before flopping off. But that seems very long ago now, as I pirouette my hairless and shivering warble of acne and pudge, burning a hole in the rug as big sis tosses off Greek and Latin words like pectorals and gluteus maximus, <clears throat> standing to show me what she means with her hands on my love handles, and now I can see myself trying to add some gaudy flourish to this memory, to make of it a fantasy, which is why I linger, hoping to misrecall the child me, make of me someone I wasn't, make of this experience the beginning of a new life, gilded doors kicked open, blaring trombones, a full beard, Isaac Hayes singing in the background, and me thundering forth on the wild steed of emergent manhood. But I think this child was not that child. Obscuring as he was his breasts by tucking his arms underneath his armpits. And having never even made love to himself yet was not really a candidate for much besides the chill of a minor shame that he would forget for 15 years. One of what would prove to be many such shames stitched together like a quilt with all its just legible patterning, which could be a thing heavy and warm to be buried in or instead might be held up to the light where we see the threads barely holding, so human and frail, so beautiful and sad and small from this remove. Thank you. What's a beautiful thing that someone saw today? Someone? Morning, dessert. Who, you saw that? How come? Where were you? Eric and you what? Eric and Emily. You were? Where? At your place? Or? Um, at my friend's house. Awesome. Great. Okay. Someone else? <laughs> it's scary to address, to announce what you've seen that was beautiful. Mm. That's neat. That's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what else? Someone else? 
it's outside. Hey, what'd you see? It's beautiful out there. It is beautiful. Yeah. No cloud in the sky. Mm -hmm. It's actually warm for once. It's warm, yeah. We saw when we were walking over to lunch, there were these two ducks snuggled in the shade of this little tree. I thought, what? Like right outside of like an apartment complex or something. Or something, right? It's like a building or something. Yeah, yeah it's a county. <coughs> yeah. That was beautiful. All right, here's another poem for you. Um, this is called. Um, this is called Feet. It's a poem about my feet. And I am going to ask you another question. Two questions. Um, does anyone know who uh, Power Man and Iron Fist are? Who's that? Who? Yeah. They're superheroes. It's a comic book. And it was probably around in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and <clears throat> it was very exciting to me because Power Man, uh, Luke Cage, he was a black superhero. So there was a superhero that looked like my dad. And I was like, ah, I love Luke Cage, Hero for Hire. I, I owned like all of them, all of them. Of course, my dad threw them all out at some point. I don't know why. Did someone say ah? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Power Man and Iron Fist. The other thing is the real world. Does that still exist as a show? OK. Is it good? Is it good? It's like a reality show. They all live in a house still? All right. Cool. OK. Thanks. Thanks. I'd say that, too. My real world might be different than your real world. But it's the same show, the same network, music television, MTV. <laughs> this is called Feet. Friends, mine are ugly feet. The body is common wreckage stuffed into boots. The second toe on the left foot is crooked enough that when a child asks, what's that of it, I can without flinch of fear, without flinch or fear of doubt, lie that a cow stepped on it, which maybe makes them fear cows, for which I repent, in love as I am with those philosophical beasts, who would never smash my feet nor sneer at them the way my mother does. We always bought you good shoes, honey. She says, you can't blame us. You can't blame. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we always bought you good shoes, honey. She says, you can't blame us for those things. And for this and other reasons, I have never indulged in the pleasure of flip-flops, shy or ashamed, digging my toes like 10 tiny ostriches into the sand at the beach with friends who I'm not sure love me. Though I don't think Tina loved me, she liked me, I think, but said to me as we sat on lawn chairs beside a pool where I lifeguarded and was meticulous at obscuring from view with a book or towel my screwy friends, you have pretty feet in that gaudy cement mixer Levittown accent that sends all the lemurs scaling my rib cage to see, and she actually had pretty feet. And so I took this as a kindness incomparable and probably fell a little bit in love with her for that afternoon, with the weird white streak in her hair and her machine gun chatter and her gum snapping, and so slid my feet from beneath my Power Man and Iron Fist comic book into the sun, for which they acted like plants opening their tiny mouths to the food hurtling to them through the solar system. And like plants, you could watch them almost smile almost say thank you. You could watch them turn colors and be almost emboldened, none of which Tina saw because she was probably digging in her purse or talking about that hottie on the real world or yelling at some friend's little sister to put her ass in her trunks or pouring the crumbs of her Fritos into her thrown open mouth. But do you really think I'm talking to you about my feet? Of course she's dead. <coughs> Tina was her name of leukemia. So I heard. Why else would I try sadly to make music of her unremarkable kindness? I'm trying, I think, to forgive myself for something I don't know what. But what I do know is that I love the moment when the poet says, I'm trying to do this, or I'm trying to do that. Sometimes it's a horseshit trick. But sometimes it's a way by which the poet says, I wish I could tell you truly of the little factory in my head 
the smokestacks chuffing the dandelions and purslane and willows of sweet clover prying through the blacktop. I wish I could tell you how inside is the steady mumble and clank of machines. But mostly I wish I could tell you of the footsteps I hear, more than I can ever count, all of whose gates I can discern by listening closely, which promptly disappear after being lodged again here where we started, in the factory where loss makes all things beautiful grow. Thank you. This poem is called um, Ode to Buttoning and Unbuttoning My Shirt. And uh, some of these poems are written kind of in the, in the mode of uh, Neruda's odes. How many of you know Pablo Neruda's poems? OK, good, a little handful of you, yeah. Um, so I'm sort of copying Neruda, even in the shape of the poems. <clears throat> but I want to write odes to mundane things, boring things deserve odes, it's sort of the argument. Ode to buttoning and unbuttoning my shirt. And I did have to actually wear a, I wanted to wear a shirt that has buttons on it. I only have a couple, so I did this for you. <laughs> Ode to buttoning and unbuttoning my shirt. No one knew, or at least I didn't know they knew what the thin discs threaded here on my shirt might give me in terms of joy. This is not something to be taken lightly, the gift of buttoning one's shirt slowly, top to bottom or bottom to top. Or sometimes the buttons will be on the other side, and I am a woman that morning, slipping the glass through its slot. I tread differently that day, or some of it anyway. My conversations are different, and the car bomb slicing the air and the people in it for a quarter mile, and the honeybees' legs furred with pollen mean another thing to me than on the other days, which too have been drizzled in this simplest of joys in this world of spaceships and subatomic this and that, too, maybe three times a day some days. I have the distinct pleasure of slowly untethering the one side from the other, which is like unbuckling a stack of vertebrae with delicacy, for I must only use the tips of my fingers, with which I will one day close my mother's eyes. This is as delicate as we can be in this life, practicing like this, giving the raft of our hands to the clumsy spider and blowing soft until she lifts her damp heft and crawls off. We practice like this, pushing the seed into the earth, like this first in the morning, then at night we practice sliding the bones home. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, like Elizabeth said, I'm a, I'm a gardener, a big gardener, and I work with this orchard, this community orchard. And uh, so a lot of the poems in this book have to do with like, you have the book, a lot of trees and fruit and stuff like that. So <clears throat> this is a poem about a tree. And I'm going to ask, no, I'm not going to ask you a question, I'm going to tell you something. Um, no, I'm going to ask it, because it's a fun question to ask. So do any of you, like any of your folks, did any of your folks do anything interesting with the placenta that came out with you? Yeah. Made prints. Oh, that's great. That's great. You raised the bar for me. That's great. Good. So they made prints, and then they... Beautiful. And then they ate it. Woo. Yeah. Yes. What kind of tree was it? Oh, beautiful. Are they slow-growing trees, beaches? Slow. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's lots of things to do with them. That was what I was searching for, um, although that was incredible. You get an A plus, too. Um, the, there's a, you know, there's, it's a tradition 
right, in, in a lot of cultures to actually put the, in some cultures, to put the placenta in with a tree or something. Um, because there's nutrients in a placenta, right? There's also, you know, the tradition that you might put a fish in a planting hole because there's nutrients, you know. So now we process fish and we call it fish emulsion or something, right? But it used to, folks would and still probably do, just put a fish in a planting hole and that's going to release nutrients in a, in a tree. This is called burial. <clears throat> you're right, you're right. The fertilizer is good. It wasn't a gang of dullards came up with chucking a fish in the planting hole or some midwife got lucky with the placenta. Oh, I'll plant a tree here. And a sudden flush of quince and jam enough for months. Yes, the magic dust our bodies become cast spells on the roots about which someone else could tell you the chemical processes. But it's just magic to me, which is why a couple springs ago, when first putting in my two bare root plum trees out back, I took the jar which has become my father's house and lonely for him and hoping to coax him back from my mother as much as me, poured some of him in the planting holes. And he dove in glad for, for the robust air, saddling a slight gust into my nose and mouth, <coughs> chuckling as I coughed, but mostly he disappeared into the minor yawns in the earth into which I placed the trees splaying wide their roots, casting the gray dust of my old man evenly throughout the hole, replacing then the clods of dense Indiana soil until the roots and my father were buried, watering it all in with one hand while holding the tree with the other straight as the flag to the nation of simple joy of which my father is now a naturalized citizen waving the flag from his subterranean lair. The roots curled around him like shawls or jungle gyms, like hookahs or the arms of ancestors before breaststroking into the xylem, riding the elevator up through the cambium and into the leaves, where when you put, where, when you put your ear close enough, you can hear him whisper, good morning. Where, if you close your eyes and push your face, you can feel his stubbly jowls. And good Lord, this year he was giddy at the first real fruit set and nestled into the 30 or 40 plums in the two trees, peering out from the sweet meat with his hands pressed against the purple skin like cathedral glass. And imagine his joy as the sun wizarded forth those abundant sugars and I plodded barefoot and prayerful at the first ripe plum swell and blush almost weepy, conjuring some surely ponderous verse to convey this bottomless grace. You know, oh father, oh father kind of stuff. Hundreds of hot air balloons filling the sky in my chest, replacing his intubated body, listing like a boat keel side up replacing the steady stream of water from the one eye which his brother wiped before removing the tube, keeping his hand on the forehead until the last wind in his body wandered off while my brother wailed like an animal and my mother said, weeping, it's okay, it's okay, honey, you can go. At all of which my father guffawed by kicking from the first bite gucket, buckets of juice down my chin, staining one of my two button-down shirts, the salmon-colored silk one, hollering, there's more of that, almost dancing now in the plum, in the tree, the way he did as a person, bent over and biting his lip and chucking the one hip out, then the other with his elbows cocked and fists loosely made and eyes closed and mouth made trumpet when he knew he could make you happy just by being a little silly and sweet. Thank you. I'm gonna read you two more poems. One's a little bit longer, but I'm gonna read this short one first. Short-ish. It's called Sharing with the Ants. <clears throat> it's another tree poem. How are you doing? You doing okay, everyone? Yeah. All right. How many people is this your first poetry reading? Raise your hands high if you could. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I hope I don't ruin it for you. <laughs> Sharing with the ants, this is called. <clears throat> a 
A euphemism for some yank and gobble, no doubt, some yummy tumble or other like monkey spanking or hiding the salami. Of course your mind goes there. Lucy Goose that you are, me too. Me too. You have a favorite? Don't lie, I've heard you say them. Tending the hive, eating the melon, how's the tunnel traffic? Or as a massage therapist would say to my pal, when his loneliness dragged him to a carpeted room in an apartment building in Chinatown where the small hands lathered his body, open the door. Naturally sharing with the ant some entomologic metaphor, the chronic yoke in lovemaking, not only of body to body, but life to death, sharing with the ants. Or the specific act of dragging with the tongue one sweat-gilded body from the tibias lookout along the rope bridge of the Achilles marching across the long plains of the calf and the meticulously unnamed zone behind the knee over the hamstring into use your, use your imagination for Christ's sakes. But I will tell you it is dark there and sweet sharing with the ants. But that's not at all what I'm actually talking about. I mean actually sharing with the ants, which I did Friday, September 21st, when by fluke or whim or prayer I jostled the crotch-high fig tree whose few fruit had been scooped by our fat friends, the squirrels, but found shriveled and purple into an almost testicular papoose smuggled beneath the fronds of a few leaves, one stalwart fruit, which I immediately bit in half only to find a small platoon of ants twisting in the meat. And when I spit out my bite, another four or five lay sacked out, their spindly legs pedaling slow, nothing. One barely looking at me through a half-open eye, the way an infant might, curled into its mother's breast. And one stumbled dazed through my beard, tickling me as it tumbled head over feet, over head over feet, back into the bite in my hand. The hooked sabers of their mandibles made soft, kneading the flesh, their claws heavy and slow with fruit, their armor slathered plush as the seeds shone above, the sound of their work like water slapping appear at night. And not one to disrupt an orgy, I mostly gobbled around their nuzzle and slurp, careful not to chomp a reveler. And nibbling one last thread of flesh, I noticed a dozy ant nibbling the same toward me, its antenna just caressing my face, its pincers slowing at my lips, both of our mouths sugared and shining, both of us twirling beneath the figs Seeds spinning like a newly discovered galaxy that's been there forever. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> that's a poem about like making out with an ant. <laughs> Poetry is capacious. You can write about anything. I'm going to read you one more poem. It's a little bit long, like 90 minutes. <laughs> you know how I'm classy? Because I have Perrier or something, this kind of. I know, I know. <laughs> this is called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. <clears throat> so the first thing you'll, you'll know and you'll recognize from Elizabeth's introduction I'm talking at the beginning of the, fairly at the beginning of the poem about this orchard that I work on. So it's called the Bloomington Community Orchard. And it's just this amazing food justice project. You know, it's like hundreds of people had worked on this project to plant like literally like 100 fruit trees and over 100 fruit bushes and all kinds of other plants with the idea of like how can a community best take care of each other and feed each other. So it's a site where you know, we're, the orchard itself is not going to produce the amount of food that's needed to like, make a dent into like, you know, feeding a community. But what it has represented or become is like this educational hub so that you know, we teach classes like, you know, about eight or 10 times a year. And we might have 25 people in the class. right? So those people are going to now know how to grow trees and manage orchards and to go on and spread that information. Totally volunteer run. Totally volunteer. You know, to like, 
we've had to have these amazing conversations. Like, there's a gate. There's going to be a gate for the orchard. Do we lock it or do we keep it open? That's a hard conversation to have because it's scary to think. Anyone could just come in here and take all the fruit they want, rip up the trees. We don't have a lock on the gate, right? So that's a place I'm talking about. <clears throat> the other thing is there's a kid. There's an idea in this poem called Era Lee. And Era Lee is now a person. And uh, you'll hear that. Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. <coughs> Friends, will you bear with me today, for I have awakened from a dream in which a robin made with its shabby wings a kind of veil behind which it shimmied and stomped something from the south of Spain, its breast a flare looking me dead in the eye from the branch that grew into my window, coochie-cooing my chin, the bird shuffling its little talons left, then right, while the leaves bristled against the plaster wall, two of them drifting onto my blanket, while the bird opened and closed its wings like a matador giving up on murder, jutting its beak, turning a circle, and flashing again the ruddy bombast of its breast, by which I knew upon waking it was telling me in no uncertain terms to bellow forth the tubas and sousaphones, the whole rusty brass band of gratitude not quite dormant in my belly. It said so in a human voice. Bellow forth. And who among us could ignore such odd and precise counsel? Hear ye, hear ye, I am here to holler that I have hauled tons, by which I don't mean lots, I mean tons of cow shit, and stood ankle deep in swales of maggots swirling the spent beer grains the brewery man was good enough to dump off, holding his nose, for they smell very bad but make the compost writhe giddy and lick its lips, twirling dung again with my twirling dung with my pitchfork again and again with hundreds and hundreds of other people. We dreamt an orchard this way, furrowing our brows and hauling our wheelbarrows and sweating through our shirts. And less than a year later, there was a party at which trees were sunk into the well-fed earth. One of which, a Liberty Apple, after being watered in, was tamped by a baby barefoot with a bow hanging in her hair, biting her lip in her joyous work. And friends, this is the realest place I know. It makes me squirm like a worm. I'm so grateful. You could ride your bike there or roller skate or catch the bus. There's a fence and a gate twisted by hand. There is a fig tree taller than you in Indiana. It will make you gasp. It might make you want to stay alive even. Thank you. And thank you for not taking my pal when the engine of his mind dragged him to swig fistfuls of Xanax and a bottle or two of booze. And thank you for taking my father a few years after his own father went down. Thank you, mercy. Mercy, thank you for not smoking meth with your mother. Oh, thank you. Thank you for leaving and for coming back. And thank you for what inside my friend's love bursts like a throng of roadside goldenrod gleaming into the world. Likely hauling a shovel with her like one named Era Lee Ott with hands big as a horse's. And who will, like one named Era Lee Ott, will laugh time to time till the juice runs from her nose. Oh, thank you for the way a small thing's wail makes the milk or what once was milk in us gather into horses huckle buckling across a field. She's like the most beautiful little person you ever saw. And she does have hands big as a horse's. And thank you, friends, when last spring the hyacinth bells rang and the crocuses flaunted their upturned skirts and a quiet roved the beehive, which when I entered were snugged two or three dead fist-sized clutches of bees between the frames, almost clinging to one another. This one's tiny head pushed into another's tiny wing, one's forelegs resting on another's face, the translucent paper of their wings fluttering beneath my breath, and when a few dropped to the frames beneath, honey. And after falling down to cry, everything's glacial shine. And thank you, too. 
and thanks for the corduroy couch I have put you on. The chairs, the rows of chairs we have put you on. Put your feet up. Here's a light blanket, a pillow, dear ones, for I think this is going to be long. I can't stop my gratitude, which includes, dear reader, you, for staying here with me, for moving your lips just so as I speak. Here is a cup of tea. I have spooned honey into it. And thank you, the tiny bee's shadow perusing these words as I write them. And the way my love talks quietly when in the hive, so quietly, in fact, you cannot hear her, but only notice barely her lips moving in conversation. Thank you what does not scare her in me, but makes her reach my way. Thank you the love she is which hurts sometimes. And the time she misremembered elephants in one of my poems, which, oh, here they come garlanded with morning glory and wisteria blooms, trombones all the way down to the river. Thank you the quiet in which the river bends around the elephant's solemn trunk, polishing stones, floating on its gentle back, the flock of geese flying overhead. And to the quick and gentle flocking of men, to the old lady falling down on the corner of Fairmount and 18th, holding patiently with the softest parts of their hands her cane and purple hat, gathering for her the contents of her purse and touching her shoulder and elbow. And thank you to the cockeyed court on which in a half court three on three, we old heads made of some runny nose kids a shambles. And the 61 year old, after flipping a reverse layup off a back door cut from my no look pass to seal the game, ripped off his shirt and threw punches at the gods and hollered at the kids to admire the pacemaker's scar grinning across his chest. Thank you. The glad accordions wheeze in the chest. Thank you, the bagpipes. Thank you to the woman barefoot in a gaudy dress for stopping her car in the middle of the road and the tractor trailer behind her and the van behind it whisking a turtle off the road. Thank you, God of gaudy. Thank you, paisley panties. Thank you, the organ up my dress. Thank you, the sheer dress you wore kneeling in my dream at the creek's edge and the light swimming through it, the coy kissing halos into the glassy air, the room in my mind with the blinds drawn where we nearly injure each other crawling into the shawl of the other's body. Thank you when I say it plain, fuck each other dumb. And you, again you, for the true kindness it has been for you to remain awake with me like this. Nodding time to time and making that sound which I take to mean yes, or I understand, or please go on, but not too long, <laughs> or why are you spitting so much, or easy tiger, hands to yourself. I am excitable. I'm sorry. I'm grateful. I just want us to be friends now, forever. Take this bowl of blackberries from the garden. The sun has made them warm. I picked them just for you. I promise I will try to stay on my side of the couch. And thank you, the baggie of dreadlocks I found in a drawer while washing and folding the clothes of our murdered friend, the photo in which his arm slung around the sign to the trail of silences. Thank you. The way before he died, he held his hands open to us for coming back in a waft of incense or in the shape of a boy in another city looking from between his mother's legs or disappearing into the stacks after brushing by for moseying back in dreams where, seeing us lost and scared, he put his hand on our shoulders and pointed us to the temple across town. And thank you to the man all night long hosing a mist on his early bloomed peach tree so that the hard frost not waste the crop the ice in his beard and the ghosts lifting from him when the warming sun told him sleep now. 
Thank you, the ancestor who loved you before she knew you by smuggling seeds into her braid for the long journey, who loved you before he knew you by putting a walnut tree in the ground, who loved you before she knew you by not slaughtering the land. Thank you, who did not bulldoze the ancient grove of dates and olives, who sailed his keys into the ocean and walked softly home, who did not fire, who did not plunge the head into the toilet, who said, stop, don't do that, who lived Lifted some broken someone up who volunteered the way a plant birth of the reseeding plant is called a volunteer, like the plum tree that marched beside the raised bed in my garden, like the arugula that marched itself between the blueberries, nary a bayonet, nary an army, nary a nation, which usage of the word volunteer familiar to gardeners, the wide world made my pal shout, oh, and dance and plunge his knuckles into the lush soil before gobbling two strawberries and digging a song from his guitar made of wood from a tree Someone planted. Thank you. And thank you, Zinnia and Gooseberry, Rebecca and Pawpaw, Ashmead's Colonel, Coxcomb and Scarlet Runner, Feverfew and Lemon Balm. Thank you, Knitbone and Sweetgrass and Sunshook and False Indigo, whose petals stammered apart by bumblebees. Good Lord, please give me a minute. And moon glow and catkin and crook neck and painted tongue and seed pod and Johnny jump up. Thank you, what in us rackets glad, what glad rackets us. And thank you to this knuckle headed heart, this pelican heart, this gap toothed heart flinging open its gaudy maw to the sky. Oh clumsy, oh bumble fucked, oh giddy, oh dumbstruck, oh rickshaw, oh goat twisting its head at me from my peach tree's highest branch, balanced impossible gobbling the last fruit, its tongue working like an engine, a lone sweet drop tumbling by some miracle into my mouth like the smell of someone I've loved, heart like an elephant screaming at the bones of its dead, heart like the lady on the bus dressed head to toe in gold, the sun shivering her shiny boots singing Erica Badu to herself, leaning her head against the window. And thank you the way my father one time came back in a dream by plucking the two cables beneath my chin like a bass fiddle strings and played me until I woke singing, no kidding, singing, smiling, thank you. Thank you, stumbling into the garden where the Juneberry's flowers had burst open like the bells of French horns. The lily my mother and I planted oozed into the air. The bazillion ants labored in their earthen workshops below. The collard greens waved in the wing, wind like the sails of ships and the wasps swam in the mint bloom's viscous swill. And you, again you, dear friends, for hanging tight. I know I can be long-winded sometimes. I want so badly to rub the sponge of gratitude over every single thing, including you, which is awkward, yeah. <laughs> the suds going into your eyes and armpit, the little sparkling gems slipping into your ear soon it will be over, which is precisely what the child in my dream said, holding my hand, pointing at the roiling sea and the sky, hurtling our way like so many buffalo who said, it's much worse than we think, and sooner. To whom I said, no duh, child in my dreams. What do you think this singing and shuddering is? What this screaming and reaching and dancing and crying is other than loving what every second goes away? Goodbye, I mean to say, and thank you every day. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for your reading. Um, I, I think I forgot to tell you, you do a question and answer. Yeah, good. Oh, okay. okay good. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to announce that Ross's book is on sale in the back. And I bet he'd sign it, wouldn't you? I'd sign it. He'd sign it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I noticed in question and answer sessions that sometimes it takes folks a little bit to come up with a question. So I was going to ask the first question. <coughs> And it's less of a 
question and more of a favor. Uh huh. Um, so in my class, we're talking about the poetry of witness, which is poetry that looks outward to the social or the political. And we've been trying to figure out what, what the poetry of witness can actually do. Hmm. And when you were walking over here, you talked about the way that our imagination has stalled out at the hmm. level of the dying. Mm -hmm. And that you think poetry can maybe get us to the level of the living. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I'll wish my students could do that. Mm, yeah, so yeah. So I was wondering if you'd be willing to, to just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, totally. It's a big room, so I'm going to move the mic around during the question. Yeah, okay. okay. But you, are you ready to do that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can I repeat the question? Oh, okay. So um, when we were walking over here, Ross was saying that he felt that our imagination has stalled out at the level of the die-in, which is a type of political protest where people will go to a public space and, and lie on the ground. And you said that you hope poetry could get us to the live-in. Yeah. And so I, was, I, just, I just want you to tell it to yeah, the yeah. students. <laughs> what she said. Next question. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the thing that I think is sort of magical and potential about poetry is that the, the imagination, like we, there's a critical capacity of the imagination and we can sort of like see a thing that's terrible and witness it, which is absolutely vital and we have to do that. But the next step is like, instead of replicating the violence, what I want to sort of participate in, and I sort of look toward poetry that does that, is to imagine what is, what, where the violence doesn't need to exist. So I want to sort of work with the, the skills, whatever, that I have or whatever. My goal is to sort of try to imagine this world that has not yet been imagined, or at least it does not yet exist, you know. And like when I think of Audre Lorde and her, Audre Lorde famous, uh, very important um, poet, when she talks about, and I'm going to misquote it in a poem, in a, in a essay called Poetry is Not a Luxury, she talks about, she talks about, um, we need, I forget exactly how she puts it, but we need to nourish our children so that they don't have to dream the same dreams that we've dreamt, effectively. That's what she says. Is this thing going on and off? I can project. So, so did you hear that? That we need to nourish each other so that we don't have to sort of replicate Good catch. We don't have to replicate the shitty dreams that we've been, man, that have manifested in some of the things that we wish not to manifest. You know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And do we have a question from the audience? Yeah. What's your revision process? My revision process? Good question. Um, let me think. It's different with different poems, I think, but. Um, most often, I'll write a poem and accumulate a draft of a poem, which might not happen, for, might take a little while. Um, but then when I start, I'll start to revise the poem, and I'll think about all the stuff, like is the image clear, is the sound right, are the lines doing what they need to be doing, blah, blah, blah. But then the biggest question I ask, is it true? Is it true? Um, and usually when I'm talking to myself, I'll be like, is that bullshit? That's usually what I'll say. I don't usually say it's true. And, uh, and that's the trickiest thing, like in revising the poem, which may come out of a kind of emotional moment um, that Adam, you know, but what I'm trying to do is make poems that will sort of exist. The emotions will get truer through the revision process. The other thing is that re with revision for me, it's like I'll write poems and I usually don't know what the poem is actually about until I revise it. So I'm getting deeper and deeper and the sort of great, like the exciting part is the first part, like boom, it all comes out. But the, the, I think I, the more sort of weird imaginative part happens in the revision stuff. That's like when I'm starting to make these weird connections in poems. So I love revising poems. I love seeing what's inside or underneath, what I thought about, what I had been thinking about. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask for a favor also. Yeah. Patience. Patience? Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll do it and I have, to have a couple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, <coughs> You know, I can say it. I don't have a lot of chances to do this. There's a poet back there, named, a guy named Steve Scafidi. He's a poet who, like, matters a ton to me. 
and <laughs> he's the guy who doesn't look like you all. You know, he looks a little <laughs> And uh, Steve is a poet who actually is a model for me about how to sort of like witness and be, you know, honor the world, like love the sort of mystery and strangeness and unabashedly sort of praise the world. And there are other poets uh, who, who I feel that about. Um, and I could say a lot of names, you know, and Neruda is a poet who does that, you know. Um, Walt Whitman is a poet who, like, going back, it's like there's so, golly, he loved the world. Jesus Christ. So beautiful. But kids, too, you know. Being around kids, I get to be around my nieces and, like, the ways that they can be fascinated by stuff, it's just fascinating to me. Um, yeah. 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 So I know that you obviously are part of an amazing community in yeah. Indiana with the Fruit Orchard and everything yeah. like that. Um, you said there's over 100 volunteers there. Oh, there, there will all the time. There's, okay. there's so been thousands. It's not like an active membership. Anybody can come and go. Yeah, you go there, right? Yeah, you can go there and volunteer. Yeah. So do they, I mean, obviously they're aware that you're an awesome poet. So mm. do, do they, do they recognize you? Oh, oh yeah, like, you know, and for the orchard, like, for my book party, I sold books, and, like, we did this thing, so, like, the money from the books went to the orchard, but you could also buy a book for half price if you promised to go to a work and learn it, you know? So, yeah, like, we're totally, and I, you know, I read poems at, like, the, the orchard, the yearly annual thing, and, like, Ross, you got a poem? I'm like, ah, it's the same <laughs> one. It's going to be the same one, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that's a... Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, both, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the same. Is it? I'm like, oh, you guys have heard this poem before, because I only have so many like tree poems. Nice to read a tree poem at an orchard event, <laughs> you know. But I've had to repeat a couple of times. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, we talked about like that, how you also have like kind of way of like acknowledging your own poetry or your own kind of poem. Yeah. Like especially in the um, you acknowledge like the source for your poem. I was just wondering, how do you decide where to place that individual poem to like not feel like that? Hmm. I think it's in the revision process. Like I. I think I get to a point in, like I realize there's a moment in the poem probably where the momentum of it is getting to a place where I have to actually ask the question. And the question is like um, something like, the poem itself asks me, do you know what you're doing here? You know, um, And that's exactly in the writing of that poem, that's, that's what happened. Like in the writing of the poem, there came a point where I started, started to sort of recognize, oh, this is what the poem's actually doing. So how do I sort of speak back to the poem? But it was through revising, you know, it's through like sort of writing through it and sort of, you know, getting beneath what the poem was actually doing where, where I came to that spot. So yeah, again, it's just like spending time on the poem. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you know, I think there's a, in the world that we sort of exist in, I feel like there's a, there's a degree of, uh, um, you know, sincerity can be shat upon a little bit, you know. Like if you're really, like you put your heart, heart on something, because we shit on our own sincerity. Like when we feel something deeply, often we're like, ah, shut the fuck up, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's something that in, the, you know, in this other sort of intellectual and like world of poetry where, you know, it's smart not to have feelings. Like someone was just telling me about some reading he gave and someone who also read something about like dis distrusting feelings or something like this, something that was just so like, you know, we have feelings, you know? And 
But, but yeah, like it, it can feel scary. It can feel scary to say like this is the thing that hurt, you know, or this is the thing that I love. To say this is the thing that I love when I ask, that's scary because it's possible that someone might be like, I don't care. Right? That's scary. Um, yeah, so it's, and it still feels like, it still feels nervous. Makes me nervous. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hey. Coming. You're welcome. Um, so my question, I've heard a lot of the criticism in your book. I think a lot of people have said that it's not anti-Asian. So I was wondering why a lot of like large hardware shops yeah. like, do do a lot of hardware and they just like you know like they just do the Yeah, I mean one of the things that I do with like those heavily and jammed lines. See you. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thanks. One of the, those heavily and jammed lines all uh I'm hoping to propel a reader down the line. And especially in those little narrow poems, the, the odes, um, I'm trying to propel a reader down. The other thing I was thinking about and I, as I was revising the poems, I was noticing that there are those heavily and jammed lines, and I was trying to think about how the instability of the line, like there will be a sort of instable line, so it's not a real coherent statement. It'll be a kind of shaky statement, and you fall in the next line. How can that indicate something about the sort of mood of the speaker? and the mood changing throughout the poem. So every once in a while, I'll kind of land on a more stable line, and then it'll get shaky again. And I was, I was sort of, as I was writing those poems, because those are some of the early poems in the book, I was trying to think about like how that stability can kind of occur and then, sh then fall off and occur, and what that means as a sort of subject matter, like a larger emotional subject matter. So this kind of emotional stability, or m emotional kind of shakiness wanting to get something, moments of like, Stability. You got that? Make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> so about the uh, orchards in Indiana. Yeah. How does um how does funding work? Like how do you get supplies and like yeah and things like that? Is there like a like a website set up for like people who want to people who don't live there still want to like love the idea and want to contribute like a yeah. amount of money? Then oh yeah. Like oh, okay, there is. Yeah. There. I mean, there's that. I don't know how much money we get from that. We get some grant funding. We get some uh, private donations. So we'll have like Orchard Breakfast where I read poems, um, those kinds of things. And there'll be fundraisers. And um, yeah, 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 it's great. Bloomington Community Orchard. Look it up if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's on the interweb. Um, yeah. Can I read this poem real quick? Can I use your book? Do you want the mic back? I don't know No, I don't need a button. <laughs> this is called Patience. And it's a. Uh, Oh, I'm so glad you like this poem. Oh, really? That's amazing. These little flowers that I'm talking about, they, they just came out. They're out now. So you can see it. Patience. Call it slow. So one of the things this poem is about is sort of the virtue of not doing anything. Call it sloth. Call it sleaze. Call it bummery, if you please. I'll call it patience. I'll call it joy. This, my supine congress with the newly yawning grass and beetles chittering in their offices beneath me as I, nearly drifting to dream, admire this so-called weed which, if I guarded with teeth bared my garden of all alien breeds, if I was all knife and axe and made a life of hacking, would not have burst gorgeous forth and beckoning these sort of phallic spires, ringleted by these sort of vaginal blooms, which the new bees, being bees, heed. And yes, it is spring, if you can't tell from the words my mind makes of the world, and everything makes me mildly or more hungry, the worm turning in the leaf mold, the pear blooms howling forth their pungence like a choir of wet dreamed boys hiking up their skirts. Even the neighbor cats shimmy through the grin in the fence and the way this bee before me after whispering in my ear dips her head into those dainty lips not exactly like one entering a chapel and friends as if that wasn't enough blooms forth with her forehead dusted pink like she has been licked and so blessed by the kind of God to whom this poem is prayer. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah.